insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Your hosts, Joseph and Michelle Whalen, a husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics, are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. Welcome to Insights into Entertainment. This is episode 67, Face Masks bonuses, and Baby Yoda. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my insightful and enlightened co-host, Michelle Whalen. Hi, everyone. How are you doing today, sweetie? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well. I see we've decked out the studio with Baby Yoda. Maybe. Possibly. Um, so only only seems fair. He's, <laughs> he's our, our guest this week. <laughs> oh, that makes me smile. So it's good, good to see the merchandise is coming out. <laughs> it sure is. Well, that was my one of my Mother's Day uh, presents. So. Yes, it was. Of course, you have an awesome husband. I do have an awesome husband, and of course, you know, our daughter kind of adopted him. She's been, you know, taking, yeah, taking him from me. So, figured I'd borrow him today. <laughs> so good, to, good to get him back in the studio. Yeah, yeah. It's always good to get Yoda in the studio, baby Yoda. <laughs> Absolutely. So this week uh, on Disney <clears throat> Detective, we have some backlash about the idea of having to wear face masks when Disney World opens back up. Mm-hmm. We have another family member of Disney who's lashing out at Disney because of their pay policies. Then in our Star Wars Insights, we do have a Baby Yoda connection. Mm-hmm. Uh, cute little uh, insight from George Lucas on that one. And in our entertainment news, we will look at Universal Studios being the first Orlando park to open and what their plan looks like. And then uh, John Krasinski's Some Good News is selling out to Viacom after a bit of a bidding war. Uh, And then, fortunately, light at the end of the tunnel, we have some Comic-Con updates coming uh, out at the end of the show. And then we will obviously have our insightful picks of the week. So, sounds like a pretty good show. Mm -hmm. Uh, Are we ready to get started? Sure. All right, let's get into it. Go for Disney Detective. So, while Disney might be the happiest place on Earth, some fans are just not feeling the magic. Uh, In an official post on the theme parks blog, the Walt Disney Company wrote that as we continue to monitor conditions and with the health of our guests and Disney cast members at the forefront of our planning, we are making several operational changes. Uh, Those changes obviously described as safety measures. Um, They would include obviously increased cleaning, also uh, limited contact with guests and the use of appropriate face coverings by both cast members and guests. In a separate update, they had said that all guests three years of age or older, along with cast members and third party operating participating employees are encouraged, uh, will will need to, to make sure that they have face coverings as well. Um, it, had said that please be ensured that you have ample amount of face coverings for you and your party before you arrive. It is an important part of protecting both our guests and our casts. Well, after this came out, it was amazing to see how many people were so against this. Um, There were people that saying that masks were a deal breaker. People can decide for themselves whether or not they should or shouldn't wear one. Another person said, well, if a face mask is required, I'm canceling my trip. There were even some people who were annual pass holders that said, that's it. I'm letting my pass expire and I'm never, you know, renewing it. And then, of course, there were bunch of 
supporters of it basically coming to Disney's defense saying thank you for looking out for everybody's well-being and in the words of you know Mrs. In- uh, Mrs. Incredible this isn't about you yeah well and you know <clears throat> I hate to interject politics into the show here but mm-hmm. this entire anti-mask movement here mm-hmm. is entirely the result of Donald Trump. Absolutely. Um, this whole idea that he wants to pretend that everything's okay because mm-hmm. he said everything was going to be okay and right. he needs to win an election. So he refuses to wear a mask out of some level of defiance. Right. Is just idiocy. Mm-hmm. And and his fanatical backers are, are such blind lemmings that mm-hmm. they're, they're going to throw... Not only their safety, but the safety of those around them mm-hmm. to the wind. Right. Out of some false sense of, you know, invasion of your freedoms. Right. Like, we're, no one's trying to take your guns away. You can keep your guns, right. okay? You can keep your guns. You can... Put a face mask on. Yeah. To go into a store, you need to wear a shirt. <laughs> right. You need to have shoes and now a face mask. A face mask. It's... If and you, you know what? If you don't want to do that, don't you don't go have to, to Disney, go to the store. Don't go to the store. Exactly. You know, you can do plenty can of see, curbside pickup. You can order you can go online. To all the places right. that all the all the businesses that think it's a violation of your freedoms, mm-hmm. you can go there. Right. And and stay away from places like Disney who are mm-hmm. genuinely concerned about the safety exactly. of their employees and their guests. Like. Let's let's get on a ride and not put a seatbelt on. Right. Like it's just I It's it's a level of <laughs> idiocy that this country I can't wrap my head around has why never had to contend with right. in the past. Right. Like there have been times that this country like I, I think of the greatest generation, you know, World War II, mm-hmm. the sacrifices that people mm-hmm. had to make, put, laying their lives on the line completely sidelining their entire home life, Mm -hmm. the rationing that had to happen, Mm -hmm. the fact that you had to go into a work in an industry for years Mm -hmm. that wasn't your chosen industry so that you could support the country. Right. And, and now it comes down to a face mask. Right. We can't wear a face mask for a couple of months, maybe if that, you know, and And what people don't understand. And it's because they get the misinformation from Mm -hmm. the Trump administration. Is that the face mask isn't for your protection. Right. Wearing a face mask isn't going to stop you from getting from contracting COVID. It's intended to prevent you from spreading it to other people. Right. So yes, what Mrs. Incredible says is correct. It's not about you. It's about everyone else. Mm-hmm. It's and about if you the, don't the have the consideration others. Right. for others to put a face mm-hmm. mask on, then please don't go to Disney. Right. I mean, that's the bottom line. Mm-hmm. So it, this this stupidity is getting monumentally worse by the day. Mm-hmm. I think, and and there are plenty of you know cast member friends of mine who totally agree, and I have friends who have now canceled their their summer trip because they know they're going to be uncomfortable in the middle of the summer when you're talking it's ninety five degrees out and wearing a face mask. Well, even you putting know. that aside. We go to Disney multiple times a year. Right. Pretty much every year. Right. We have no intention of going to Disney, not because they're going to make me wear a face mask. Right. But because I want to see how effective these measures are before mm-hmm. I expose my family to that oh, danger. Oh, absolutely. And that's really, you know, what what it comes down to. You know, we, none of us in our family has been tested for the antibodies. We We don't know how susceptible... You know, we as a as a family are. Why would we want to put ourselves in that right. situation? A Disney vacation is a luxury that mm-hmm. we can do without for right now. Mm-hmm. In the right. in the uh, name of safety mm-hmm. and security. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Should we go down and mask be required? We wouldn't have a problem wearing no. the masks. No. Any more than I'd have a problem washing my hands or using hand sanitizer. Or having my temperature taken as I walked in. Yeah. I, I, I don't have object no to people problem. searching. 
It's right. more to me. It's more of a privacy violation having my bag searched for mm-hmm. weapons, right. Than wearing a mask, right. You know, people are getting behind this idea that oh, I don't, I shouldn't have to be made to wear a mask. You're not made to, right. But if you want to go on private property, which right. is what Disney and World that's is, their, that's their rule. That's their policy, right. If you want to go there and mm-hmm. take advantage of the services that they offer, mm-hmm. you have to abide by their rules, just like. You know, going shopping or going to to Costco or BJ's, if you don't adhere to their rules, you aren't allowed in. Or if you don't want to abide by the rules, go someplace else. Absolutely. So now that people hate Disney for face masks, (laughs) let's talk about why Disney family hates Disney. So now. now another relative has come forward basically slamming the company's bonuses for managers while workers are furloughed. Quality is um, so important to you. So it's- this is Brad Lund, who is the grandson of Disney, said in an interview that all family members will join in our dismay regarding the Walt Disney Company's outsized payments to executives during the furlough period. Um, He basically said, I have already expressed my hope that the Disney organization continues to give reasonable compensation and to support and support to its many loyal employees in the spirit of the company, which my grandfather was so proud of. Uh, It's the right thing to do during these difficult times. What's kind of interesting is that he is currently embroiled in a decade-long legal battle over his inheritance with trustees of his mother's estate. So that kind of was an interesting little dig, you know, me maybe he's worried that he's not getting uh, you know, his money, you know, be, because of it and figured, well, if I'm not getting my money, let let's bash, you know, my grandfather's uh company because they're paying out you know, to the executives when you have all these furloughs. Well, and, and I'll bet you part of it's the fact that they, they <coughs> decided not to pay the dividend. Can you imagine how much money he gets from a dividend? Yeah. You know, you're not getting your money from the dividend because right. you're a stockholder. Right. But I'm going to go out on a limb and guess he's probably got a few more shares than you do. So that's going to be a significant hit to his mm-hmm. income. Yeah. So thought it was kind of, you know, interesting that he he jumped on the, the bandwagon and obviously... We've talked about it numerous times that, uh, you know, Abigail Disney came out multiple times, not only bashing uh, Disney because of the dividends, but also because of the salaries that they were, you know, that the executives were getting versus how much, you know, the park employees were were making and the conditions that they were working under. So, And I have to question what he's done with the fortune he has gotten from his family mm-hmm. to help the workers. Right. Because Abigail Disney's come out and she's been a, a vocal critic of Disney. But what but, actions but has she? But we've not seen her do right. anything f- other than publicity stunts. Right, right. And that's what this smells mm-hmm. like to me. Is this, yeah. you know, this guy's basically crying because he's not getting his, his trust fund dividend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know how much weight you can put behind it. Of course, I don't think that Disney should be paying out these kind of bonuses to their managers when they are furloughing their employees, but it's their company. They can do what they want. Right. And, you know, and I'm sure they're not the only company that is paying out their bonuses that, you know, technically were from last year. Correct. And... You know, a a lot of companies are probably in that same boat that they had it budgeted for last year, so it gets paid out this year. But yeah, it does kind of leave that bad aftertaste in your mouth of, well, these executives are still getting a weekly paycheck or a monthly paycheck or whatever. How about you defer their bonus until the end of the year and use that money to help? You know, you're well, see, and that's a, you know, I guess my take it uh, is I, you know, from a selfish standpoint that Disney can run their company the way they want. Mm-hmm. When it impacts yeah. me, which it will probably next year when they decide to raise prices to make up for all the business that they lost, mm. then I'll get up on my soapbox and start complaining. Right? Because no, I get it. At that point in time, if you've got <laughs> money to pay bonuses out to managers who are basically sitting around doing nothing then you've got absolutely no ground to raise your your ticket rates Mm -hmm. and your resort rates. Yeah, if anything, they, 
I would hope that they would lower them, knowing that that would be an incentive to get people. Well, to, and you know they're not come. because right. you're going to be operating at reduced numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're going to be operating at increased cost because of all the all the sanitary right measures that True. they have to take. They're going to have to ramp up their custodial staff mm-hmm. to keep up with it. So they're going to use all of these reasons here to raise the prices even more than they because. Mm-hmm. It's not like they don't raise them multiple times a year to true, begin with. True, true. But I'm just thinking because you have, you know, these cruise lines that are giving these, you know, massive discounts to, you know, to book a cruise or the airline tickets that are, you know, like dirt cheap. It would just be nice if Disney kind of like, hey, if you book now, you know, we'll give you some sort of discount because we know. Yeah, I, I mean... Th- it, it would be nice. It would it would make sense, and right. it would go a long way to mm-hmm. help yeah. build confidence in your customers. Mm-hmm. Um, but you figure the airlines and the cruise lines have to. Right. Because you're not going to get anyone going on those. Right, whereas airlines Disney. Ha- yeah. People have to use the airlines just to conduct daily life and business. Mm. Um, it, what makes it competitive is because of the number of airlines that are out there how many disney worlds are out there true so when you're the only disney world out there you can do what you want you can do what you want yeah true so so that was all we had for our disney detective Mm -hmm. we will take a quick break and come back with our star wars insights For over seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. The Second Civ Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. So this was a, a cute story that that popped up um, that talked that said that George Lucas reveals a shocking connection between Yoda and Baby Yoda. So um, I guess this past week it was the 40th anniversary of the release of Empire Strikes Back. So obviously there's not a lot of new stuff that seems to pop up about, you know, the original trilogy, most of the interviews, um, you know, the stories are, are kind of the same, been talked about over and over. But one of the the new things that kind of popped up was that the director of Empire Strikes Back, um, Irving, uh, er, I'm sorry, Erwin Kirshner had said that he treated Yoda as an actor on the set, sometimes actually talking to the prop instead of actually addressing Frank Oz, who was down below. Um, And what's kind of cute about that is that nearly 40 years later, the exact same thing has been happening on the set of The Mandalorian. Um, In a behind-the-scenes, the the documentary uh, of The Mandalorian, which has been on Disney+, Plus, Deborah Chow, one of the directors basically said the same thing that it was kind of weird and you know and and it was one of the weirdest things and the best things because the actors actually were treating baby Yoda as another actor on the scene uh on the set uh and Werner Herzog would actually speak directly to the puppet um and was actually like talking to him and helping direct him 
in various scenes. So kind of cute and weird that here just this extra puppet on the cast was treated like a, an actual cast member. So kind of kind of cute, um, you know, little story that history repeats itself that right. Yoda and baby Yoda weren't just extra props. Yeah. And that is kind of cute. And, and you have to, you know, as an actor, you have to imagine it's, it's difficult with all the green screen stuff that mm -hmm. you do nowadays. Right. And all the imagination mm -hmm. that you have to have as an actor mm -hmm. to sort of sell your part. Right. It's got to be really difficult acting with a puppet. Right. You know, I can't even imagine. And and granted, Frank Oz did a fantastic mm -hmm. job bringing this piece of foam rubber to life. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and they do even more with uh, the, the Baby Yoda because it's mm -hmm. an audio animatronic that's remote controlled and everything. Right, right. So it looks ridiculously realistic. Mm -hmm. um, but to treat it, you know, like like Werner Herzog did as, a, as another actor on set and right. to direct it, I think is a demonstration of being immersed in the whole environment there. And I think that's just, it speaks to his dedication and professionalism as an actor, mm -hmm. I think to the entire endeavor. So very, very cool story. Mm -hmm. So that was all we had for star Wars insights this week. It was a slow week for star Wars. Yeah. Slow week. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on to our entertainment news. Go for entertainment news. So Universal Studios Orlando is actually the first theme park in the area that is planning a reopening. Um, so it was announced uh, just last week that it will be a gradual reopening. Universal will start the process on June 1st. Only team members would be allowed into the parks on June 1st and June 2nd. Then on June 3rd and June 4th, there would be, uh, they would be open for limited availability, availability, <laughs> sorry, for some pass holders. And then the plan is to open the park to the public on June 5th, again, with a limited capacity. And as of right now, they're not even sure what that number is. Um, obviously, there are questions and controversy over whether it's too early. Um, and here are some of the changes that we know of as of right now. Uh, one, there will be no valet parking. Uh, cars will be parked one or two spaces apart. Visitors and employees must wear a face covering. Uh, visitors and employees will have a temperature check. No one will be allowed in if you have a temperature of 100.4 or higher. Park capacity will also still be limited. Again, no headcount as to what that will be. Um, the play areas will be closed. Uh, virtual lines will be managed through the app, which is uh, kind of like what Disney did uh, with uh, Rise of the Resistance ride. So they're probably doing the same thing uh, with that. Lines will be spaced out. There will be no single rider lines available. And hand sanitizer stations will obviously be located throughout the park. Um, so the plan that was discussed was actually um, approved by the Orange County Reopening Task Force. And now it needs the approval from the mayor of Orange County and also uh, f the Florida governor to move forward. Um, Obviously, at this time, no other parks have made their dates as to when they'll be opening. So they're the first guinea pig, really, to to kind of see how this all works out. You know, I have to applaud uh, Universal for for being at the forefront here and being mm -hmm. the first ones to dip their toe in the water here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a, a huge decision, given this current circumstances. Knowing full well that the motivation behind this isn't this altruistic, let's get back to life, normal type mm -hmm. thing. It's we're desperate for money. You know, mm -hmm. they're, they're losing money like right. hand over fist. Well, and what's kind of interesting, too, is that, you know, they're they're first opening up to pass holders. So they're not making any money. Right. For well, those and, people. And that's the thing. They're 
that the level of caution that they're right. taking here is admirable. Right. Because you're right. They're not making any money off these mm-hmm. pencils other than concessions and right. food, obviously. Right. But they're doing it in a way to sort of test out what the policy right. is. Right. See how how many people, how, you know, do, you know, are the the guests adhering to everything. Right. Um, you really I will haven't... say, though, that the method and the schedule that they're going by... <clears throat> Is questionable because given the two month or uh, two week incubation period of the mm-hmm. virus, you would think you would start off with this limited right. pass holder only for two weeks, and then and then see what the result was, and then open it up after that. Right, and they're they're shortening that window significantly, right. which you know exposes more people to risk. Which is and dangerous. maybe that's why you know as of right now they haven't approved it. You know the the mayor and the governor haven't haven't approved it yet. We really haven't heard much from Shanghai because Shanghai Disney was the first of the Disney parks to to open, um, where they did they they announced you know when things would be opening. You had to make a reservation to attend. Um, so either you were using your pass holder ticket or you bought a ticket and they only had online so many tickets available if you didn't buy a ticket you you didn't get in and they almost had um timed entrances you know you were the first people to go in you were the next group you were next group and we really haven't heard anything you know from from them how it went is it working you know or, or anything like that yet so i wonder how it will go with Disney because you figure they'll probably Disney will probably follow the same type of thing. They'll probably do a pass holder, you know, initially and then see how well that does and then open it up. But are you opening up your resorts also? You know, are you allowing people to to stay on your property or is it just park only? So are you Basically, opening it up just for Florida residents or anybody that lives well, and local. Well, given the fact so. that Disney shut their parks down before they shut the resorts down, mm-hmm. I'd have to assume they're far more equipped to handle people at the resorts than at the park. I mean, the park has mu- a much higher level of exposure because right. of the crowding. Right, right. Um, and you figure with the resorts, you don't put people next to each other. You right. know, you could space out the rooms and the floors and only allow so many people. You know, we know that the the idea of the, the quick service areas will be a lot different. So you can probably do a little bit more testing, like you said, in the actual resort than you know, see him in, in the park. So it'll, you know, it'll be interesting to see how, how this goes. And hopefully this works out well and doesn't cause any, mm-hmm. any exposures that could have been avoided. Uh, I think this is a win that a lot of people need right now. Yeah. To, to, you know, something st- positive to, right, to look something forward to, to start getting back into that normalcy of life. Mm-hmm. So, so, you know what we could use? We could use some good news. Could, could you, we? Could you give us some good news? Sure. So, John Krasinski, Some Good News, sells to uh, Viacom CBS following a massive bidding war. Um, if you haven't seen it or or watched any of it, it's a feel-good web series um, that has been playing... Uh, for eight weeks, there were eight episodes um, that John uh, had had posted. Um, he was the the producer of it, um, and it seems that there were a lot of uh, other companies that were interested in in getting their hands on it. Really, uh, so following a massive bidding war, the Feel Good web series has now been licensed to Viacom CBS. Um, CBS All Access, which will be actually rebranding over the summer, showing some more original content, um, has now, you know, taken control of this uh, lovely little web series that he had started. Um, He will still be involved as an executive producer, uh, but he's not going to be hosting the new episodes. A new host will actually be named uh, at a later date. 
Uh, but he still will have some sort of online presence. Um, he, you know, he came out and said he couldn't be more excited or proud to be partnering with CBS Viacom to be able to bring some good news uh, to so many more people. Uh, from the first episode, our goal was to create new a new show dedicated entirely to good news. Never did I expect to be joining the ranks of such historic news organization as CBS. Um, during its run, he self-financed it and produced it uh, weekly, and it was basically designed to just bring good news to, to people. Uh, during, you know, the, the stay home during the uh, pandemic. Uh, sources tell The Hollywood Reporter that he initially resisted the urge to sell the series despite a wave of incoming calls from a variety of suitors. Uh, his team received a flood of inquiries regarding their first viral episode um, and various broadcast networks and streaming platforms you know, made the the call. His original plan was to continue to make some good news for free and uh, the wide audience that YouTube would provide. As the series continued to grow and each week it became more and more viral, corporate sponsors became interested and helped with different giveaways. Uh, AT&T, for one, actually um, did a giveaway uh, for first responders, uh, Boston uh, Red Sox actually supplied tickets to f- future games for uh, Boston area health workers. Um, so this is just kind of like it grew, and obviously, hey, let's let's add some some more money to it. I guess it kind of seemed like. Um, during its its time period, uh, the YouTube channel actually collected 2.56 million subscribers, and each episode would end up with almost 17 million views. Um, so, in some respects, it's kind of sad that, you know, it got sold out, because I think that was part of the attraction to it, because it, it had this homemade feel to it. Well, see, and that's kind of where I take exception to this whole yeah. thing because he tried to portray this whole thing as, oh, I wanted to do something nice, so I threw this together real quick. And that's not what it was at all. Mm-hmm. This was a produced, a written show. He happened to be doing it from his home, mm-hmm. but it was not him sitting around in his pajamas trying to do a podcast. Right. It was a professionally done show mm-hmm. that he obviously had intent to to do something mm-hmm. with. Well, and, and what was interesting was in this article, it said that he actually came up with this idea seven years ago and just never, you know, did anything with it until late March when everybody was, you know, home right. quarantined. Well, and, and, I, and I have to wonder where they're going to go with this. One, right. the reason it went viral mm-hmm. is not because of its content. It's because of its host. Mm-hmm. So without that host, where are you going to go? Right. Number two, it went viral because of the time period in which it was produced and Absolutely. the circumstances. Mm-hmm. Yeah. As, as we move through this pandemic and we get past it, people don't want good news. If people wanted good news, then the news networks would put good news on. Mm. The news networks put the stuff on that gets ratings. So this type of thing is not going to be something that's going to be profitable for the news network. So I don't know why people went into a bidding war for this because you've got maybe six to eight weeks left of it that you can really milk anything I for. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I'm very skeptical of today's news cycle and, and the networks today because – the only kind of news that people seem to want to hear or, or pay for is bad news. See, and and I think me personally, I would much rather rather watch good news than hear you know, like I personally I don't watch the, the nightly news because and neither do I, because of the negative news. Because of the negative aspect of it. But each week when a new episode you know, would would pop up, I would take the 20 minutes, you know, to, this, to watch. If, if some good news shows us anything, it's that there is a 
plethora of good news out mm-hmm. there that can be sourced mm-hmm. and shown to people. And maybe that, maybe that becomes, you know, for a little while again, you know, just, just look at again, you know, after nine 11 patriotism, all of a sudden was on the rise you know, everybody was so proud, you know, and then after so many months, everybody kind of went back to well, I the guess way they my, were. My point you know? is to go back to what I was saying is there's a ton of good news out there mm-hmm. and the news networks don't report on it mm-hmm. because when they do, people change the channel. Right. So why do they think that this is going to be successful in a traditional news environment? The thing that made this so successful was that it was such an untraditional Mm -hmm. method of bringing that to people. And they're already moving away from that by turning it into a corporate-based show Mm. without the original host. Mm -hmm. Um, So, And I have to really question John Krasinski's motives because he set out my belief, despite the, the protest to the contrary, is that he set out to make this a business venture. And he was very successful when he was able to get these other networks to get into a bidding war for it. And I'm sure he's making a small fortune off of it, which is exactly what he was trying to do. But he was trying to portray it as though it was a homegrown, I want to do something nice to make people feel good. And it really wasn't. It was a, oh, let me find something that I can sell to the networks and make a fortune. And that's exactly what he did. So, but I'm the cynic of the I know you are. So. <laughs> I have to point that we out. know, we know. Uh, so that was all we had for entertainment news mm-hmm. this week. Yep. Uh, we will be right back with uh, some Comic Con updates. Go for our Comic Con. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. And and it wasn't like I didn't know you were going to do it. <laughs> so, obviously, during all of this that, that's going on, a lot of uh, Comic Cons got canceled, pushed out, uh, have gone virtual. Um, if you do a search for virtual Comic Cons almost every day or every couple of days, there are different panels that are showing up. Um, even concerts, there are, um, different concerts that are, are popping up on Twitch, Facebook live, Instagram. Uh, and right before we, uh, started, uh, our, our podcast today, I happened to look just to see if any of the local ones have rescheduled or, or moved their dates out, um, because we knew some were coming up, some had kind of you know, been postponed. We hadn't heard anything. Um, so what I thought was interesting was, uh, wizard world, Philadelphia, that was actually supposed to be coming up within the next couple of weeks. Uh, and now they've updated their dates to January 15th, 16th and 17th of 2021, uh, which is kind of interesting because January usually isn't when anything, uh, is going on. Um, so that actually, in a way, when you think about it, something to look forward to after the first of the year, because usually Comic-Con convention is usually summer, spring. Um, usually nothing is going on in the winter. So again, something to kind of look forward to, you know, come January. Um, then the Keystone Comic-Con, which is usually in April, that now has been pushed to uh, the end of August, August 28th through the 30th. Um, and then the Greater Philadelphia Comic Con, which would have already happened, because uh, that's usually April, that is now uh, the beginning of September. So September 4th through September 6th, as of right now. Um, Wizard World, I believe their tickets were available online to purchase. I'm guessing if you had already purchased them, probably they would still be good, just with new dates. Um, Keystone, uh, I don't those were uh, those tickets were available uh, on their website right now, but Greater Philadelphia it said ticket sales opening soon. So, kind of gives you, you know, something to to look forward to. I'm sure, um, you know, especially for the August one, they'll probably have 
you know, something come out about, you know, face coverings and, and things like that. Um, I, I wonder if they'll be doing limited ticket sales, um, if it's going to be one of those, you know, kind of like with the, the theme parks, you have to buy your ticket online, you know. I could even see them going to reservation times. Yeah. Like when the uh, museums do their yeah. their displays. Right. You know, you can be in here at, at this time, mm-hmm. from this time to this time. Right, so right. Yeah, so it, it'll be interesting as, as things get a little bit closer, you know, what changes. Um, I know in terms of concerts and things like that, we had two concerts that we were supposed to be going to uh, this summer. Both now have been canceled. One was for uh, the end of July. One was for the end of August. And the end of August one just got canceled this past week. So so this is this is know. some light at the end of the yeah, tunnel if yeah. you're a convention goer like we are. We, mm-hmm. we, we do enjoy our convention season, mm-hmm. getting out, you know, mingling with other uh, sci-fi convention ears and, and mm-hmm. seeing what the new Pop wares are. Pop things yeah. and stuff like that. So, so it's nice to see that they've, they're, they're bringing these back, that, that we're just postponing them and, and, you know, something to look forward to. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we'll be right back with our insightful picks of the week. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. Go for your insightful pick. So my insightful pick this week is a documentary. (gasps) Oh my God, I'm turning into you. Oh, you're you're (laughs) working my side of the street here, lady. Um, So it is a documentary um, called Becoming, which is a 2020 um, American documentary film about the former first lady, Michelle Obama. And it's partially based on her best-selling memoir of the same name, which was released in 2018. Um, And this takes a look at not only um, her book, but her uh, 34-city book tour uh, that she did um, with with the book. Um, very well done documentary. You get to see um, the behind the scenes, not only prep of her traveling throughout the country on this book tour, but also um, the different guests that she, she comes in contact with. So each... Uh, locate each city that she did the tour in she had a different uh host um you know from different celebrities local celebrities um and 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 she would also visit different schools within the the city um so you got to see the um the behind the scenes of that where she would meet with uh different students um various different minorities um, and do little Q and A's with them. She also, you got to see some book signings and, and you know, what was also interesting was you got to see behind the scenes um, film from when she was in the white house, you know, and how the news portrayed her and, and all the the issues that she had. And, and you also got to see, um, you know, she, she showed where she grew up in South side of, of Chicago and her house and, you know, her mother still lives there. Uh, you got to, um, 
they did interviews with her parent, uh, with her, her mother, her father uh, passed away, um, and her brother, and got to see, you know, a very intimate look. And, you know, it's, it's just amazing how classy she is, you know, and, and you just have this total respect. And, and you got to see and, and, and feel, you know, how hard it was for her growing up and becoming, you know, who she, she is today. And, and, you know, just so well done. And, and I, I didn't read the book, but it makes me want to go and, you know, get a copy of the book and, and read it to read more stories than, than what was, what was done. So nice. Good pick. Thank you. My pick this week, as promised, is a documentary. The last couple <gasps> of weeks, I have not done documentaries. <laughs> uh, so this week, my pick is um, Disney Gallery Star Wars The Mandalorian, streaming on Disney+. Plus. Uh, this is an eight-episode documentary series that pulls back the curtain on The Mandalorian. Each chapter explores a different facet of the first live action Star Wars television show through interviews, behind the scenes footage, and roundtable conversations hosted by John Favreau. Topics this season include the filmmaking process, the legacy of George Lucas's Star Wars, how the cast brought the characters to life, the series groundbreaking technology, the artistry behind the show's practical models, effects, and creatures plus the creative influences, the iconic score, and connections to Star Wars characters and props from across the galaxy. Um, the, we love the show already, so mm -hmm. watching yeah. the documentary was really just kind of a no-brainer type thing. But the documentary itself is extremely well done because it's a unique perspective behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, just listening to the various directors talk about their techniques and their experience and how they, they got involved with the projects, mm -hmm. uh, listening to the actors and the, um, the admiration the cast has for each other and the experiences. Uh, the last episode were, I think four into the series right mm -hmm. now. And the last episode was really the one that, that had the most impact on me. And that was the technology side. Yes. Um, they talk about uh, the challenges of shooting a show or a movie or anything on a soundstage and how there's physics involved in lighting when you're using green screens where uh, the one the one example they give you is the fact that the Mandalorian's helmet is really one big, 360 degree mirror. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So in an environment where you are using green screens in post-production, you need to go in and remove the green screen effect from the helmet and then overlay the proper reflection on the helmet. And you have to do it in such a way to make it look realistic. You have to make the lighting look realistic. Right. So if you're front lighting a green screen, you have to you have to have that light reflection off of the armor of the man learning because he's wearing all reflective armor. Mm -hmm. um, because if you're not out there in the desert forming these scenes, uh, filming these scenes, you don't have that lighting effect. So what they do is something that's really, it was just incredible. It was a 360 degree room. Right. They call the volume. And this was actually a story that we had had months ago. Right. That came out and we, you know, we were like, what, what, what is this? So it was so interesting to see in this behind the scenes to actually now experience it. Right. So it was, it's a 360 degree soundstage that they shoot on and the walls are all, um, LED screens. The ceiling is an LED screen. So when they project, uh, they don't project. They, they, they show the actual desert scene mm -hmm. and they set the, the, the floor with whatever 
you know, material, whether it's stone, dirt, or whatever, or there's crates or whatever, and everything just blends together mm-hmm. yeah. to the point that even the actors can't see where the real stuff ends and the screens begin. But the effect that it has is there's a sun setting behind the Mandalorian, mm-hmm. and the the lighting effects of that sun setting are reflecting off of the armor. Yep. They show one scene where he's in the cockpit of his ship. And there is a space battle going on and there's laser blasts that are going past his ship. And you literally see the reflection of the laser blast mm-hmm. in his helmet. Uh, it's such a level of realism right? that no one's had the opportunity to work with it in the past. And in this last episode, uh, they were interviewing uh, Carl Weathers and Carl Weathers even talked about the scene where they're in this boat in a lava flow. Mm-hmm. And the boat isn't moving, but because all the scenery around them on the walls is moving, the actors were getting motion sick. Right, right. In the in the boat because yeah. it was so realistic. Yeah. And you know, we talked in the earlier article about being able to act to a puppet. Right. And Carl Weathers talked about the need when you're on a green screen that you have to sort of envision it yourself mm-hmm. so that you can play the part and, right. and play towards everything. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing that with multiple other people, it's very difficult because everyone envisions it differently. Right. Because it's coming out of your imagination. You're, you're, the scene's described to you, but you as the actor have to imagine it. So everyone imagines it differently. Mm-hmm. And he said with this technology, you don't have that problem because everybody's seeing the same, the same thing. thing. Yeah. So... When you're talking about something or you're interacting, you're referencing something, everybody else knows exactly what it is, where it is, what it looks like, how it moves, everything. Um, so it's it's an incredible technology. But the documentary goes into that level of detail. Mm-hmm. Uh, it gets you inside the heads of the directors, mm-hmm. uh, the cast. Um, and it's just, there's a lot of great stories in there. Mm-hmm. You know, there, was, there was a story about uh, uh, Pedro Pascal who plays the Mandalorian and there's one scene towards the end of the season where he gets injured in a blast. So right. they got him all all doctored up with blood and everything when they finally take his helmet off. Well, at the time that they shot the scene, he had an onset accident. Right. And he walked into a two by four or something like that and, and had to get stitches on the nose. So they take him into the the emergency room and they see all this blood on his face. It's all prop right. blood. And they're like, Oh, get him in, get him in. We got right, to right. take care of. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's really cool. Like little anecdotes like mm-hmm. that and yeah. the, the insights and stuff. It's, it's a very well done series. And you, you talk, you, you see people, you know, Kathleen Kennedy makes appearances mm-hmm. in here and provides insight. Uh, Dave Filoni comes in and he's providing the insights that he had, with working with George Lucas on the Clone Wars and everything. And it's right. just, it's the passion that comes across mm-hmm. from this documentary yeah. Yeah. really lends itself to giving you, a, as a diehard Star Wars fan like I am, it you gives are? me a, the confidence <laughs> that, that this show and that, and that the franchise itself is in good hands. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, I think, something that, that comes across is that the love is there you yeah. know it isn't just oh we just did it just because we had to there's love yeah. you know and and it's sacred yeah. to them you know yeah there's this unlike the story we had last week where you know you had a disney executive saying that it's all fake right it's not to the, fake to these guys <laughs> no no these guys like like dave filoni comes in with this encyclopedic knowledge oh like my people God, yeah. people he'll, he'll somebody will reference something on set about star wars and he'll explain it to them right. with this depth of knowledge mm-hmm. that you would get from like a college professor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and it's because these guys all grew up with it mm-hmm. and they all have this passion for it. Yeah. And like, it all, it, it's one of those things where I wish I was in the industry so that I could be a part of that team mm. because that team, there's such a synergy on the team that mm-hmm. they have right now. And that yeah. comes across very clearly in the documentary. Yeah. So Disney Gallery, Star Wars, The Mandalorian, streaming now on Disney Plus. Uh, And we'll be right back. (laughs) 
So that was all we had today. Mm -hmm. uh, before we go, I would appeal to our viewers and listeners to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, uh, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and pretty much anything else. So subscribe to all of them. When, well, when you, when you do <laughs> look us up. just one is fine. <laughs> when you look us up. Uh, we will show up as audio only for insights into entertainment, and we will show up as video only for insights into things. Insights into things uh, does cover all of our podcasts. Just audio is insights into entertainment, um, and outside of that, we stream. We should be streaming on Twitch five days a week. I had some technical issues right. this week where we were shut down for a bit, uh, but we do stream on Twitch five six days a week. Uh, at twitch.tv slash insights into things. You can email us at comments at insights into things.com. We're on the Twitter at insights underscore things. You can find us on YouTube at youtube.com insights into things. You can get all of our podcasts, audio and video and summaries on our website at www.insightsintothings.com. Our audio version of the podcast at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com. And for those who love the evil empire, you can get us on Facebook <laughs> at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. And I think that's it. That's it. Another one in the books. Have a good week, everyone. Bye. Bye.